will introduce our speaker. So uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Toby Gardner, who uh, uh, I've known for about 20 years. He was an undergraduate at Edinburgh University when I was there, when we first came across each other. And since then, he did his PhD at the University of East Anglia and, uh, uh, and a master's there, and then did, had a fellowship at Cambridge, and in 2014 moved to the Stockholm Environment Institute, where he's now director of the TRACE initiative, the Transparency for Sustainable Econom Economies initiative, which is what you'll hear about uh, today. And uh, so over, over to you, Toby. Welcome to the seminar. Thanks very much, Yadavinda, um, and it's great to see you all, uh, many old faces, old friends, new faces, new friends. Um, this is a wonderful forum uh, that I've followed over the years, and it's a real pleasure to be to be part of it. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay, you got that? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, okay, great. Um, good. Uh, well, what I would like to do is give a bit of a tour through why we started this work in TRACE, what's driving it, what are some of the challenges that underpin what we're trying to achieve, where we've got to so far and where we're trying, uh, where we're trying to go in the future. We're at a quite an exciting juncture um, in the trajectory of this initiative, which is a partnership between uh, SEI and Global Canopy based down the road with, with those of you that are in Oxford, but also an increasing number of research, NGO and other partners around the world. Um, and it came out of um, an idea that was first, uh, first uh, was published in 2015. We published a prototype uh, of the platform that is now Trace.Earth in the Paris conference. We launched Trace in, in, in the Marrakesh conference in 2016. Uh, subsequent to that, we went through a kind of proof of concept phase with a focus on Brazilian soy. The last couple of years, we've then been growing the platform and expanding and rolling out coverage of, the, of, of how we're mapping supply chains uh, for commodities to many other countries. We now cover about half of global trade uh, in commodities linked to um, deforestation. Now we're moving into a new five-year phase with a new strategy, uh, which is much more about how to deploy those data into the market, if you like, how to try and drive up uh, impact and uptake. So the ideas, the critiques, uh, we do very much welcome uh, critiques, uh, connections that you guys may have with all of your wonderful uh, work and networks, much appreciated. But let's kick us off then uh, with um, let's kick us off not with my words, but to set the scene uh, for uh, for Trace with a little bit of it's David's words. It's estimated that every year around 3.8 million hectares of forests are cleared. A lot of that clearance is driven by demand on the other side of the world. We want cheap food and we want to have choice on offer all year round. These commodities often provide the mainstay of countries' economies, but many are produced in ways that are not sustainable. So a consumer walking into a supermarket may unwittingly be contributing towards loss of biodiversity. What we're doing is taking customs data, shipping data, and for the first time, we connect them all together and ask who's buying from the hotspots where we're really losing biodiversity. We now have enough data to be able to identify the main drivers of biodiversity loss. Soy, cocoa, coffee, palm oil, and beef. So I shared that partly because it's a chance for some gratuitous uh, Attenborough's extinction, the facts, uh, which many of you may have seen, but also to reflect that um, appreciation of the fact that our environmental footprints, as especially in Europe, is disproportionately overseas. And a lot of it is linked to uh, um, agriculture um, is exploded uh, in recent years. And 15 plus million people have seen that documentary um, so if we wind back five years ago, the level of understanding and awareness and therefore potential for driving political change in this space is really undergoing a relative transformation. And we see that reflected in, in, in some changes in the landscape of opportunity. If you look at the recent um, spurt of, of work around uh, regulating regulations and due diligence uh, mechanisms across Europe, including in the UK. 
So, um, as David Amber said, deforestation uh, went up by 2.8% uh, since 2019, and it's gone up again because the data from Global Forest Watch were released just recently uh, with over 4 million hectares of tree cover loss, which of course is not quite the same as, as deforestation. And we know that uh, it's quite hard to put a precise number on this. Actually, we're trying to fine tune this number now, but it's somewhere between a third and a half of that is linked to uh, commodity expansion, uh, of which at least a half is linked uh, to uh, trade in, in those same commodities. Um, and there are many barriers to how we can uh, better connect uh, consumers of one kind or another, and I don't just mean end consumers here, uh, to impacts. Um, and at least three of them are identifying where the origin is, which is um, which can be done at different levels, critically identifying who those suppliers are, but most critically, and this is where Trace really tries to come into the fray, is doing this across entire sectors, because it's no good to say this up front, uh, knowing uh, the origin uh, of the sourcing of one particular company or even of one particular country, much less one particular supply chain for one household. Um, what we need to understand is if any of those actors are making changes, is the net effect of those actors resulting in positive changes on the ground. We ultimately don't and shouldn't care about the performance of Cargill or Waitrose or Unilever. We should care about whether actions being taken by their sectors uh, even out to, to reflect net positive changes uh, on the ground, which is why having a bird's eye view, being able to understand uh, the dynamics of trade across an entire sector like Brazilian soy, like Indonesian palm, like Indonesian pulp is, is so vital. And transparency, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be um, so passionate about trace, uh, can have a, a transformative impact. Um, and there are, um, there are a lot of uh, questions that immediately come to mind in thinking about data and transparency. And often um, there's an assumption uh, that we need forever more, uh, more data, better data, more detailed data. And, you know, as a researcher, or at least someone who's got a background in research, and many people here, we often are persuaded that, you know, more data can help. But um, a question that uh, I always um, ask when we go into a new place, into a new context, uh, where we're trying to map the supply chain, um, is what information uh, is already available, or what information is feasible to collect. And the answer, from our experience in looking at supply chains, is often a hell of a lot more than what people have assumed uh, going in. And then a second question is what information is actually needed? What level of detail, what level of cover is actually needed to start driving change? And, and, and the general conclusion that I have to that is it's often less uh, than what is typically assumed. And I, and I stress to start driving change, because as we all know, these processes of change are messy, they're complex, they involve lots of factors outside of evidence. Uh, so if we drill down too, in too much detail and delay or procrastinate delivering information into a change process to jolt it more in the right direction, then the opportunity costs uh, will be will be high. So I'd like to talk through uh, three big chunks or four big chunks. Sorry, um, a little background on 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 the coupling of trade and land use uh, via global connections, um, changes in the background uh, information landscape, the information age, if you like, what Trace is doing, what what sets Trace apart, uh, and then coming back to the bigger picture about transparency and. How can we understand transparency as, as being transformative in a positive way? Now, we're all appreciative of the fact we live in a globalized uh, economy, but this is changing beneath our feet so fast uh, that I am constantly, and I'm reading this stuff all the time, constantly um, made aware just how much more integrated and how much more globalized the economy is just in the last few years uh, compared to uh, five, five years ago. Um, in the last uh, 15 years, uh, global demand for forestry and agricultural commodities has more than tripled uh, to over one and a half trillion uh, dollars. Uh, market integration um, is extremely tight. And if you look at um, the value, uh, market integration in lots of different ways, but integration in particular through global value chains and the fact that many of these commodities are processed by different actors along the way, the value of processed uh, commodities in the hands of these intermediary actors uh, superseded the value of primary commodities quite some years ago. I, I forget the date, um, but there's a lot of change there. Yet at the same time, a lot of the influence and a lot of the power uh, in this system is consolidated in the hands of a, a startlingly few number of companies, which on the face of it suggests that we have some 
some easy entry points for change, but put another way, it also demonstrates quite how much inertia there is in the system uh, because there is such a strong, such a strong monopoly. Um, and if we look at um, how information has been, I mean, there are many books written on this, but um, information, disinformation uh, is, of course, the centerpiece of all of our lives uh, uh, now. Um, and back to my, um, my earlier point, I, I think that really what challenges us the most is being more creative um, and being more thoughtful, more intelligent, if you like, in making better use of the information that is already available, which often involves repurposing information collected for one application uh, for, for another. And I'll, I'll come on to a few examples of that. But one is, um, if you go to, there's a really cool visualization if you're into that kind of thing, shipmap.org, um, which shows uh, an animation of individual ships moving around the world based on uh, AIS data, uh, which uh, large ships, anything above a relatively small ship actually, um, is required to emit uh, a beeper every every uh, few minutes um, to avoid collision. But those data can be wonderfully repurposed uh, to understand all sorts of things, including illegality. But also we've started to couple those data with uh, data on trade and commodities to tell us about commodity and trade route specific emissions um, linked to specific cargoes, which of course is immensely valuable, not least just a few days ago, we heard that the UK government has included shipping emissions for the first time uh, into their um, into their target setting uh, for emissions reductions. Uh, so thinking about ways in which we can repurpose data uh, is for us and has been a, a really key lesson in how to harness um, this information uh, um, ocean that we're all that we're all swimming in. Uh, and of course, there is an assumption behind um, work around transparency in our work that it can be uh, a game changer uh, for lots of reasons. Um, um, we wrote a few, a few of us, um, including Connie, who I'm glad to see is, is, is with us, um, wrote a paper on some of this stuff a few years ago. Um, there are lots of ways in which transparency can help, of course, it can demystify complexity. And for me, that has been perhaps the most powerful impact of Trace to date. It, it demonstrates um, to influential people and interested parties that certain problems are not as intractable, they're not as um, incomprehensible as previously assumed or as conveniently assumed, uh, let's say as well, because uh, the complexity and the opaqueness of global trade is often used, uh, whether it's a genuine barrier and sometimes a convenient excuse for, uh, for inaction. And seeing uh, the faces and the appreciation that yes, it's messy, but in fact, your supply chain, you uh, 10 European countries that have signed up to deforestation commitments. Yes, you're buying from thousands of places across Brazil for soy, but actually 50% of your supply comes from 50 places and actually 50% of your uh, deforestation embedded in, the, in that supply and the emissions linked to that deforestation comes from about 15 places. So in two clicks, you've, you've, uh, you've um, kind of uh, really simplified the problem and identified a subset of places, of suppliers, of connections where most of the problem lies. So let's start there. It's about understanding where we can start. And then if you can start there, then you can make that problem more tractable and you can start enabling key actors on the ground. But on the flip side, um, transparency, and we're very wise to this, or we, at least we appreciate it, trying to mitigate its effects is, of course, altogether more complicated. But um, transparency can be um, uh, can pose a risk. Um, information access is not the same as information use. Um, understanding and the ability to access and use and interpret data varies enormously, uh, of course, between actors across supply chains. Um, and many of, many of the data sets that are used can often be used uh, in quite coercive and top-down ways. Um, and what is made visible um, by one actor uh, necessarily determines what is possible to be made visible by others in, in, in many ways. So um, how can we try and ensure just putting information out there uh, doesn't just overwhelm or, 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 or detract uh, from work and, and, and voices that need to be heard? And also uh, linked to this, there's a hell of a lot of hype around information and information technology. I have a personal kind of bugbear around the obsession of blockchain, which has its role, um, it has its place, but because it's a shiny new thing, 
that many people, you know, including myself, don't fully understand. It's assumed that it can solve all sorts of problems, um, but that overlooks uh, you know, a basic premise that no technology, whether it's blockchain or any other, can guarantee uh, that the people inf inputting information in, in, in the beginning are trustworthy or that the data that they're in inputting are accurate. Um, so for, for, for supply chains of commodities that are bulked and, 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 and crushed and processed along the supply chain, like palm, like soy, there are fundamental limits to what technologies like blockchain can deliver. But we obsess about them and we let them become um, risk becoming white elephants um, unless we're continuously critical about what is the purpose for which the information we're collecting is being is being put, which brings us nicely to Trace. Um, <clears throat> so Trace is a science-based um, uh, data and analysis initiative uh, that is trying to put new information, new understanding, new, new data access into the hands of market actors, of companies, but also financial institutions, of governments, uh, and of pressure groups uh, to help collectively in their different ways, often antagonistic ways, uh, to help in a transition towards more sustainable both production and consumption and we're trying to help achieve that by um in a sense uh, i think it's fair to say revolutionizing uh, the transparency of these connections by bringing um a level of scale uh, even though we don't always have the precision a level of scale of, of supply chain coverage um and so uh, but there are three main uh, we're launching a new uh, homepage in trace in a few weeks actually but there's three main areas uh, that you can think of what Trace provides. One is supply chain data, uh, which you can find on trace.earth, uh, which links uh, buyers, markets to places on the ground um, and impacts associated with those places. Another is finance data, trace.finance, which plugs on um, mapping of ownership and financial uh, relationships into those companies. And then there's the research and the analysis that we do, which is at insights.trace.earth. Um, and put very simply, uh, Trace is trying to support two agendas. On the one hand, enable uh, action uh, by particularly investors, uh, commodity buyers, and consumer countries who are focused on uh, Europe and China um, by essentially uh, facilitating risk management, understanding where is the greatest risk exposure, and helping triage and profile and zoom in on where the problem is greatest now. Trace doesn't do much more than that. Uh, in trying not to oversell. It's really about simplifying and triaging and providing a jumping off point, an entry point uh, for, for, for action, whether it be uh, to, to directly engage and demand uh, greater standards, whether it's to provide some form of, of financial assistance, a partnership, or, or even divestment. But on the flip side, trace data analysis is also used very actively uh, to strengthen accountability, whether that's by impartial third-party assessments uh, like what we put out ourselves, like what others put out using Trace and other data. Uh, WWF published a report that got uh, very good coverage uh, last uh, last week uh, on the EU's impact um, on deforestation, which was based on Trace data. And it's very much the modality in which we're, we're trying to work it, it, is provide and empower actors with a much broader uh, shop front than we ever will um, with, with access to better data. But also campaigners, but also enforcement agencies um, to uh, strengthen accountability, both to better understand how much progress is being achieved by market leaders, where there is leadership, where there is leadership that's being claimed, and also identify how much more work needs to be done and which, which measures and interventions are more or less effective. So that's why Trace exists. Uh, what is it? What sets it apart? Um, well, historically, uh, our understanding of global trade has um, depended um, heavily and still does in many um, economic models, um, multi-regional impact output assessments, footprint calculators on bilateral trade data of flows of commodities, in this case soy out of Brazil, uh, to other countries around the world. This is the Chatham House Resource Trade website, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, but these data have a role, but they're very, very limited. Uh, what Trace does is uh, it goes one step uh, deeper and it takes the middle part of the supply chain. Here's a little animation um, which tells us um, how much uh, soy is being produced across Brazil there on the left um, and then looks at the export of soy from different regions from 2000 via different companies into different countries. So you've got hundreds of thousands of flows there and interactions, but by putting all these data together, you can zoom in and you can choose a particular market, a particular buyer, Germany, for instance, and you can zoom in uh, 
uh, and look just at that supply chain in detail. You can pull out uh, specifically which are the companies that are importing into Germany from Brazil, exporting from Brazil into Germany, and which are those top places. And it's interesting if you look at this example, which are those top places, they are all um, municipalities in the Matapiba region uh, of the Northeast Sahara, where it's the, uh, the largest deforestation frontier for soil expansion um, in the world. And once you've made that connection, Trace then allows you to rescale those flows, not just in terms of tons, um, but in terms of uh, uh, environmental or, or indeed social impacts, but, but most uh, commonly in terms of hectares of deforestation. So you can reinterpret uh, what those connections mean. And that is a starting point for then answering a whole host of different questions. It allows us for the first time here to look at how sourcing patterns and the impacts linked to sourcing patterns shift across space and time. This is the sourcing of Bungi, uh, the large soy trader in Brazil, um, moving across Brazil over the last decade um, and showing how the deforestation on the bottom there changes as Bungi's sourcing pattern changes. Now, that, the ability to do that is only possible because we have this coverage at scale uh, across the whole country. And it allows us to discern um, what the footprint is uh, between different groups of buyers. Uh, and here you can see just comparing China and the EU, uh, you get quite a stark contrast because the EU, by virtue of geography, really, uh, but also historical um, trade relationships, uh, sources on average compared to China more from the northern regions of Brazil, which includes, therefore, the deforestation frontier of the Amazon um, and the Cerrado, um, than China does. So per ton, until 2018, the per ton uh, of soy deforestation uh, intensity, if you like, um, of the EU was greater uh, for soy across the last decade than it was for China, which is um, a new insight and an important insight that we're often repeating uh, when we hear um, arguments that the EU doesn't have a role to play in trying to shift, uh, engage with the deforestation problem because it's, it's a much smaller player. Yes, it is a smaller player in terms of volume, but actually uh, the relative impact that we have, have, have had is, is much greater. And by being able to link those flows by coupling lots of different data sets, we're typically, talk, typically talking about 10 to 30 uh, data sets in any one of these maps, but linking um, customs data, linking shipping data, um, linking logistics data, self-declared data by companies, you can discriminate individual players as well as the supply chains connecting different places. And as I've said already, you can do that across entire sectors. So it's that blanket coverage that provides us with the ability to have a much better understanding uh, of net effects and overall impacts. Now, that's what distinguishes Trace. Um, how is that then used? Um, there's lots of examples here. Here's just a few, uh, just to break it down conceptually, and then I'll give some, uh, some, some more recent practical examples. But first and foremost, it does simplify that complexity. And I can't keep uh, repeating this point enough. This is a simple bubble plot that shows um, there the volume of, um, of, of uh, beef being exported by the main uh, meat packers from Brazil. Um, and because we can make these connections, we can just rescale those bubbles to look at uh, volumes uh, of, of deforestation or hectares of deforestation linked, linked to that trade. And it, it boils down the problem. And we had a, uh, I'll always remember a panel, a panel discussion we had in, in a meeting in Oslo a few years ago, where there was um, on the panel was a major uh, campaigning organization, as well as a representative from a major uh, commodity trader, um, and they were talking about uh, trace data, um, and it became this 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 tug of war between uh, the campaigning organisation was saying, well, this is helpful because we're basically looking for who had the biggest bubbles, and the trader was saying, well, you know, our job is to try and make the bubble smaller, and and that basically is the theory of change behind um, what we're trying to do. Um, and when you start to uh, discriminate uh, these connections, uh, as I've said you can start to identify um, entry points. So here we did a roadshow in China um, a year and a half ago, and the main message that really resonated with um, many of the companies we were speaking to um, is how disproportionate the deforestation, the emissions linked to Chinese imports is when you look at the sourcing regions across the country. Uh, so only 8% of the volume comes from Atopiba, but 80% of the deforestation risk and the emissions risk uh, of Chinese imports comes from Matapiba. So that's that's huge. And it allows, um, I mean, you could say, well, let's just all leave Matapiba, but that's not really an option, given that it is the rapid 
uh, expansion frontier, a lot of investment is there, but it does mean that interest and engagement needs to be targeted there. Um, and it also, um, once you've identified those entry points and you can map uh, markets to, to, to regions, you can start to paint maps, um, not by characteristics of, uh, of the biomes or of the sustainability performance on the ground, but instead by the nature or the identity of the actors that dominate um, the trade in those places. So if you can discriminate, I think this, this looks at which buyers, which companies make up more than 50% of the exports from a, given, from a given region, and then that region is painted um, with the color of that buyer. It gives you a sense of who has agency, who, who has potentially has agency in a particular place uh, to affect change there. And then finally, you can start setting baselines. So this is one of the, the real um, uh, flagship kind of uh, in, uh, graphs, uh, infographics that, that Trace uh, can produce that I think is one of the more interesting ones where we can cross um, levels of deforestation um, on the one hand with the coverage uh, of deforestation commitments on the other. So we want to be looking for places that have high levels of deforestation, but low levels uh, of, 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 of commitment uh, being, being made uh, by um, the, the companies or it could be countries that are sourcing from that region. So they are the gaps, even presupposing that the commitments uh, are going to be effective. And you can see in the case of Brazilian soy, that there is this gap, this hole here, um, particularly around the Mata Piba region, where we do have high deforestation and low commitment coverage. And with that, you can then start to map trends in exposure to deforestation and associated impacts between committed and non-committed actors. And that is in many ways the end game, because we want to see um, that buyers, uh, that the supply chains that are associated with buyers that have commitments are everything else being equal, uh, on a downward or more downward trajectory of deforestation compared to supply chains uh, linked to non-committed actors. So that is a little bit on why trace, what is trace, um, how it can make a difference uh, in different ways. Where are you at now? I already mentioned that we've we've reached about 50, 55 percent coverage by volume. Um, now, when you start picking up uh, soy and beef and palm, uh, whether by volume or by acreage, uh, then you already have a big part of the puzzle, but we're starting to work on new commodities. Cocoa uh, in West Africa, a few weeks ago, uh, we published a new data set uh, that's the most kind of accurate mapping we've done yet uh, on exports, exports of pulpwood um, from Indonesia and pulpwood derivative products, which find their way um, into all sorts of, um, uh, of, of end uses, uh, including polymers and a lot of, uh, a lot of textiles. Um, so to give a few examples uh, of, um, of where uh, Trace is, uh, is, is starting to work. On the enabling side in risk management, we've done a lot of work with, uh, through various industry associations, inputting on um, sourcing guidelines on, on best practices with some individual companies have worked through many service providers that uh, are starting to use Trace. Um, and one of those was we did some work together with ProForest who are a close partner uh, and the uh, Consumer Goods Forum uh, around something that's now moved into a different, a different, um, a different agenda, but the Soy Buyers Coalition, which was a grouping of some uh, 15 or so European-based retailers and processors, who individually um, ha found it very hard to understand how they can best engage um, with deforestation linked to their soy supply chain, because individually their supply is quite dissipated and also quite small. But you put them together and you ask, which are the places where you're collectively drawing large volumes and collectively associated to high levels of deforestation risk. So a simple heat map, and you can really boil it down and try and try and move a, a, a group of companies uh, to thinking about engaging around this issue into a much more pre-competitive space. Because let's not worry about the fact that company A is sourcing a bit more from here than, than there than, than company B, but together you're all sourcing quite a lot from these places. Let's not worry about the detail how can the sector work together uh, to engage and turn around the deforestation in that particular place? Um, in consumer markets, um, as I think many of you may know, there's, there's been an absolute explosion of engagement um, kicked off by France in 2017, but more recently, the UK, Germany, Belgium, Holland, and increasing number of countries and also the European Union 
um, as well with the uh, action plan for uh, deforestation and forest degradation to bring in new legislation uh, that imposes a requirement, a due diligence requirement uh, on companies, domestic com companies in those countries uh, to do due diligence on their environmental and social impacts overseas, which in legislative terms is unprecedented. Uh, so if that can be brought in with enough rigor and at enough scale, it can set a model, it can set a precedent that's, that's really, really quite interesting uh, to think about. Um, and, and trace has been used across an increasing number of campaigns. Of course, it's much easier to pick up trace data and use it to, um, uh, to point the finger and use it to, uh, to name and shame. And it's been used uh, to good effect by many uh, campaign groups um, this, and also many kind of main journalism groups. This was, it appeared in this, the, these top picks by, by Greenpeace in 2019. Uh, working together with um, Guardian and Institute for uh, Investigative Journalists um, on the beef, uh, the beef trade in, in Brazil. Um, and so that's some just, I mean, all of this is a bit of a whistle stop, but to give you a flavor um, of some of the uh, applications, and there's an increasing number, now we're trying to move into this more deployment phase. But as part of that, and alongside that, we're also trying to uh, do a lot more and increasingly do more uh, to curate these data and to enable others uh, to analyze and access and uh, um, and hopefully there might be some interest amongst this group to be able to um uh, to to, uh, to to bring trace trace data and insights into your own work so in july we published uh, a year um, a yearbook on trace data across uh, seven uh, key commodities um, with a number of different uh, analyses and kpis trying to look at what is the big picture um, of deforestation exposure of trade, of trade dynamics across soy, beef, palm, but also uh, chicken and pork uh, and the soy and, and maize that's embedded in chicken and pork. Um, and that has led to a, a host of, of interesting insights. Uh, and just to give a few, just a few, a few kind of examples of what trace data allows, well, obviously the bread and butter is looking at basic trade patterns um, and trade dominance and trying to understand who is really connected to where. And what we can see if we look at some highly consolidated sectors like soy, um, what we found is that um, across all of Brazil, Argentina and Paraguay, and indeed across all of the commodities we're working in, at least half of the trade is handled by five or fewer companies. And you can see here this, this, this tree map that shows that pattern across Latin America. We're working in Bolivia now. So bringing in Bolivia, we'll have the full uh, package of Brazil Argentina, Paraguay, and Bolivia, which make up the vast majority of soy coming out of Latin America and traded into Europe and China. It then allows you to look at market share and risk, um, as we've been uh, as we've been looking at already. And it also allows you to look at market dominance. So this is soy coming out of Brazil into Europe, into China, uh, and domestically. And just look at how it's changed from the size of the domestic market in the early years, Europe really dominating. And if we extended this time series even more, it would be even more dramatic. And China just really pulling ahead just in the last few years. Um, and, uh, and this has only increased in the last couple of years uh, with the demand uh, for Brazilian soy. Most Brazilian soy uh, feeds Chinese pigs. But as we've already noted, um, that doesn't translate um, into um, uh, absolution of, of any responsibility of Europe because until last year, until 2018, I should say, uh, the deforestation per ton um, of soy coming into Europe was higher, much higher than that going into China. It can then allow us to start looking in more detail at some of these hotspots and the extent to which, and this for me is an obvious but still really important message coming out of our data. We all know that deforestation is concentrated um, in particular places, but when you combine that with the extent to which supply chains are often concentrated in their sourcing in particular places, then we, we have a picture that shows just the extent to which the sourcing and therefore the risk on the embedded impacts in particular supply chains is highly concentrated in very few places. And, and those places, in this case, if we're looking at beef, um, this is beef across Brazil, but in all of the commodities, um, if, you're, if you're in the highest risk or the top, the, the, the top decile, uh, this is, um, of, of sourcing regions, at least 10 times greater impact uh, than the average for that sector. Um, and you can look at this across different commodities and just see the extent to which um, in Brazilian beef, um, more than half of the risk is in less than 5% of the regions for all the commodities we look at. 
but in the case of Brazil, just 2% of the nearly 3,000 municipalities make up more than 50% of the deforestation embedded in exports of Brazilian beef. And Brazil uh, consumes the vast majority of, of its beef, as, as many of you will know, but nevertheless, Brazil remains the largest exporter of beef uh, in the world uh, because it's such a large producer. And we're starting some new and exciting work now that we want to launch uh, in the summer to develop an app um, which will gather information uh, by consumers across Brazil in supermarkets um, uh, in Brazil to scan meat packages and try and understand the domestic uh, supply as well. Um, and we've seen, therefore, that some of these high-risk regions contribute disproportionately uh, to the risk exposure. And the case of Matapiba is quite emblematic. Uh, but it's also the case if you zoom in more uh, on specific farms. So we did some work um, on illegal deforestation on soy um, in, in Mato Grosso um, that was published um, by Trace in June. It was picked up by The Economist and it's led, it's led to a whole series uh, of engagement uh, processes from the Brazilian uh, Federal Prosecutor's Office through the soy industry to the European Parliament using legality and using embedded illegality uh, in the soy supply chain as a powerful uh, lever for change. But just in this instance, and only in the state of Mato Grosso, the largest producer exporter of soy in Brazil, 80% of the illegality, which almost all the deforestation uh, linked to soy in Mato Grosso uh, is indeed illegal by Brazilian law, but almost 80% of that took place on only 2%, 400 farms. That is a very small number of farms, which makes it possible for the industry, uh, for prosecutors to target those specific places and try and tri triage the problem uh, quickly. And, and that helped because it was, in thinking about strategy, um, we had a very strong collaboration with two Brazilian uh, partners, Imaflor and ICV, um, which then uh, we worked closely with The Economist to try and uh, bring more attention to this, various outlets in Brazil as well. Those things all came together uh, to, 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 to help kickstart what are now, I think, quite some constructive um, engagement processes. Um, and if we're thinking about concentration of risk, it's also interesting to be able to compare across commodities that we've worked in and the extent to which um, the risk is really uh, heavily concentrated. If we compare just within the meat industry of beef and chicken, the deforestation per tonne of beef exports from Brazil is a thousand times that of chicken exports because chicken is mostly fed from soy in the south of Brazil with very little deforestation. But even within the beef industry in Brazil, if you look only at the live cattle sector, which is a fairly abhorrent sector because thousands of cattle are shipped live to the Middle East for the most part, um, very poor conditions, mostly out of the port, the single port of Bacarena in, in Pará. But the deforestation linked to that trade is five times that linked to the fresh meat, the, 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 um, the frozen meat trade, fresh and frozen meat trade, mostly because the live cattle industry is concentrated in Pará uh, with particularly high rates of deforestation. But you compare Brazil to Paraguay um, and the deforestation per tonne of beef coming out of Paraguay uh, and deforestation linked to the Chaco um, is nine times that of Brazil. So it helps provide um, a lot more context. And coming, coming, uh, coming uh, towards the end here, if we look at um, zero deforestation commitments, then we're starting to be able to pull uh, some interesting insights looking across commodities, just in terms of coverage, because we're able to map, we've mapped systematically um, and a lot of this work has been led by Global Canopy. What has been the coverage of commitments of these different commodities? If you added pulp to this list, all of the companies that are exporting pulp from Indo Indonesia all have strong commitments. Uh, palm in Indonesia, very strong coverage. Soy somewhere in between and the beef industry uh, far behind. That's changing quite quickly, but that more or less is the gradient. And if you look at well, which of the companies that do and don't have commitments, what you see is a pattern here with increased deforestation risk exposure across the page. Uh, the companies that don't have commitments, those in red, are typically um, exposed to more risk uh, than those that don't, uh, than those that do have commitments, which you may expect, but it raises a flag, of course, that the action and the engagement is not necessarily happening in the places and with the actors with the greatest impacts. And if we just eyeball the level of risk exposure linked to companies across the different commodities that have made um, uh, commitments, those in green, uh, contrasting to those that have not made commitments, those in red, and you could do this for countries as well. What we don't see is any discernible pattern. What we don't see is a systematic 
difference with less uh, deforestation risk uh, amongst committed actors compared to the uncommitted actors. Now, that is in part because this is a complex picture. Many of these commitments are very, very new, but this provides a very important and powerful baseline because if we don't see a change over time with increased, um, decreased uh, risk exposure and decreased deforestation trajectories linked to supply chains by committed actors, then uh, we, we can call into question the efficacy of commitments overall. And just finally, um, the work we're doing on trace finance, which was a new and, and experimental and exciting frontier of work uh, we launched in October of last year, um, on the back and driven by the fact that the investment community is finally starting to wake up uh, to the fact that they have a role and responsibility in this. Um, and we're seeing an increasing number of statements, but also commitments and some action by the investment community. Um, and there's a lot of noise and interest, of course, around the, um, the, the whole investment side of what's expected in the climate conference in Glasgow and all the work that Mark Carney is leading. Um, so we're keen that Trace Finance plays a part in that. And in the way that Trace maps the, uh, the supply chain flows um, uh, and physical uh, flows of of, of commodities, what Trace Finance does is it looks at who owns those companies, not just who owns them, but who's investing in them, who's lending to them. And what we've launched so far um, is about uh, a trillion dollars worth um, of connections in equity, bonds, and loans linked to Brazilian soy and beef and Indonesian palm oil. Um, and we're wanting to now roll out uh, that expansion to other financial instruments to encompass other forms of capital raising mechanism, including bonds, government bonds, um, and of course, to more, to more commodities and to keep it up to date. And this just gives you a flavor of how you can then start to look at portfolios in a new way. Um, here's a little video. This is a graph. All of these data are based on a graph in the same way that you know, the Panama Papers uh, expose was. Uh, and you can, you can look at, in this case, the Norwegian State Wealth Fund, what it has direct investments in various um, various companies on the ground linked to deforestation, indirect investments rather via its holdings in banks, which in turn, uh, BTG, Capco, in turn have holdings themselves um, in, uh, in, in companies linked to deforestation more directly. Um, and in other, in other jurisdictions, uh, that they have holdings here um, in, in Malayan banking, which is a major uh, provider of, um, of capital and loans regional loans into, um, you can zoom in and look at uh, which these which other companies the, these banks are investing into. So again, it's a way to filter, triage, and target um, where some of the um, impacts are concentrated the most and who's able to take action. Um, and if we just take the case of the Norwegian State Pension Fund, they divested a few years ago now, 2018, from Minerva, one of the major uh, meat packers in Brazil, by, by looking at their direct exposure because they had direct holdings in Minerva. But this graph database uh, and what we're doing with Trace Finance, the power of that is it exposes all of the indirect pathways by which the pension fund, the wealth fund, was also invested in Minerva, whether it was by the fact that they own uh, quite a significant chunk of BlackRock, uh, who in turn own a small chunk of everybody, um, or whether it's via the fact that they own, uh, you can see here, part of Walmart, who buys from Minerva, depending on your evidence base um, and what you consider to be uh, sufficient evidence to drive a claim, um, you can see that there's a lot more indirect exposure pathways than there are direct. Um, and there are trillions of dollars. Um, this is a recent analysis from the team in Forest 500 and Global Canopy. There are trillions of dollars uh, locked up in, um, in investments uh, by uh, institutions that do not yet have uh, set deforestation policies. So there's a huge amount of work uh, to be done here. <clears throat> and I just, um, I'm just looking at the clock, so I'll be brief here to leave some, uh, some time for us to, uh, to us to discuss, but thinking about uh, how we can um, look at, and this is, this goes into much more depth in a paper we published in 2018 in, in world development, but how we can think about the impact and the transformative potential um, of transparency. And there's a few kind of home truths here that just to drum home. One is that transparency um, is a means, not an end. That seems obvious, but transparency is all too often um, trumpeted as an end in itself, um, uh, as a goal in itself, and that somehow being transparent itself is a good thing. It's only good if it leads to change. 
on the ground. Transparency is double-edged in lots of ways. Um, and for me, the main one is that on the one hand, transparency can lead to quite coercive action through compliance mechanisms, but also if done well, it can lead to cooperative action, not that coercive action isn't sometimes needed, it can lead to cooperative action and trust building. Uh, but those two things can uh, is a fine, a fine balancing act. Not all transparency is good. It can exacerbate uh, existing uh, inequalities in data access and power. Um, and understanding change, what really matters is what's happening on the ground. It's great if factor A is certified or commodity A is looking more sustainable than commodity B. But we need to add up those impacts and understand how much uh, change uh, they, 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 they represent uh, with deforestation and other associated impacts actually on the ground. And this balancing of detail and scale being key to ensuring uh, impact, that's at the core of trades. How much information is enough, um, given that if we go for too much information, we necessarily compromise and sacrifice achieving understanding at scale. Um, and something that's become increasingly apparent to me, whenever we get, and this is true, this is a bandwidth problem, of course, now, if you give transparency to one thing, you necessarily reduce visibility of another. Uh, if you give attention to one thing, you necessarily reduce attention to another. So whether you take risk analysts in banks, they typically work a commodity at a time. Um, and whether you, if we present information on deforestation, that means that deforestation gets talked about more than uh, labor uh, infringements or land rights, for example. So how do we, how do we uh, grapple with that? Um, transparency needs to be public in order for it to be used for these often antagonistic uh, ends uh, necessarily, uh, but it also therefore needs to be mediated. Um, and this concept that we've talked about a bit of infomediaries traces such an institution that tries to uh, play a role of providing an independent uh, curator of information that helps facilitate access and understanding to a wide variety of actors. And like sustainability, transparency is always a process of continuous improvement or regression. So in, in our few years that we've been doing this, some data sets that we rely on have dried up, perhaps partly in response to some of the work that we've been doing. Now that can either be seen as a success or a failure, um, but our typical recourse is if information access becomes worse, then we, um, we'll just roll back to worse data and the burden of proof uh, to demonstrate that a particular buyer or investor is not linked um, uh, to, um, uh, to deforestation becomes harder to show, um, providing we hope an incentive to increase uh, transparency. And, uh, and last but not least, um, bringing back to all of these points, um, is that no transparency is going to be an effective substitute um, to, to good governance, of course. Um, and uh, we're not uh, going to see uh, an increase, I don't think, in transparency go away, uh, despite um, the toing and froing of, 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 of access restrictions in, in some places. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a bit of a tour. Hopefully it gives you a flavour. Uh, look forward very much to comments, questions, critiques, ideas. Hey, thank you, Toby. If you want to stop sharing your screen. And uh, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Feel, feel free to either post a question in the chat uh, I invite you to uh, unmute and, uh, uh, and put your camera on and, uh, and ask directly to Toby, but if you prefer for any reason for me to ask, I can channel those questions there, uh, or raise your hand and, and ask directly as well. And I encourage you again to sit your cameras on now for the, for the Q&A session so we have a, a visible audience as, as much as possible. Okay, does anybody want to kick off with a question? Uh, Connie, get your hands up. Great, thanks, Toby. Excellent talk, a whirlwind through um, a lot of really um, interesting innovation, innovative work. And I think you won't be surprised by one of my questions. Uh, is you know you just raised a really excellent point about how if you make one thing transparent, you risk obscuring other things. And I was wondering um, how and if Trace is thinking about looking at issues beyond issues of of deforestation um as as you know things that might be worth making transparent and also i just would make a comment too that one of the things that that's so striking in all of this is it isn't just making transparent deforestation where and what companies are linked to it but the consolidation of the marketplace 
And, you know, is that something that the trace is, is reflecting on or other people are wanting to use this data for? Because, you know, from a sort of social equity perspective, it's really, really interesting to see that, um, how, how, yeah, how our markets are working. So yeah, just a couple thanks. of questions. Thanks, sure. thanks, Connie. Very welcome comments and questions. Um, and as you know, I'm 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 very alert to um, uh, to those. Um, and to the first one, what are we doing? I mean, the thing that what we've what we've moved away from in in the development of traces is, is obsessing too much about building a platform, trace.earth, and one way of visualizing the data which necessarily draws your attention to particular issues. That's great, it's a calling card, it opens the space, but actually the core trace product is that supply chain map, which if data are available around land rights, around loans, around whatever it might be, spec speculative activity, um, it can be plugged in. If there's spatial data, statistical data or spatial data of some kind, it can be plugged in and made relevant to and can be linked to the marketplace via our data. So we're developing a whole host of entry points to our data behind the scenes through some quite innovative tools um, that will allow a much more of a kind of plug and play approach. So moving away from we're, we've actually stopped investing very much in the, in the online tools that you see and move, moving towards a much more diverse kind of portfolio of ways to access the data, pull the data, um, APIs and, and encourage people and help people come along and standardize their geospatial data because often it isn't and often as, as you'll know many of the issues that you work so closely with on social and equity dimensions are inherently less quantitative and they're less well uh, mapped geospatially but how can you make them more relevant uh, to markets um, through whatever uh, type of application um, by by having more entry points so that's what we're, we're, we're trying to uh, we're, we're, we're trying to do that. Um, and then in terms of your, your second question, so the, I mean, there's a huge limit, of course, to what we're doing internally in terms of um, in terms of analysis and thinking about, uh, never mind the deforestation, just what, how could these data help um, in understand equity and power balance? And my answer is partly putting it back to you because we'd love, uh, and I'm going to disclose here, if you don't mind me, uh, Connie, uh, that uh, Connie's, um, graciously accepted to be on the Science Advisory Committee for Trace. Um, and we invited her precisely because we want, um, we want this kind of reflection and, and, and critical thinking about aspects that go beyond the typical agenda about how to tackle deforestation. So um, there are, um, the, our, the, the, the colleague who's now leading uh, the Trace research strategy, some of you may know him, Mayron Bastos Lima, he's a political scientist and very much uh, working on these issues. Uh, so we do hope that we'll start to be able to enable a lot more work uh, on that uh, in the future, because of course it's all part of the same bigger challenge. If we can't crack the way in which leverage versus crack and or crack uh, the, the consolidation of the market, uh, then we won't affect deforestation as well. So absolutely. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andrew? Um, Thanks, Edvinda, and thanks, Toby. That was just, I mean, it was wonderful and very, very interesting and, and encouraging and exciting and all that. But uh, I, I was sort of related point to, to, to Connie's, your, your comment that um, sort of that transparency uh, on one top, transparency is a zero, might be a zero sum game. And if you, if you shed light on one thing, you detract light from another. And I can see some of that. Uh, I can see the concern there, but there's also a, a, a positive feedback element I, well I'm optimistically suggesting that there might be in that as long as um, uh, people that you might want to um, change the actions of think their actions are invisible um, then that then there's there's no light and once you start shedding light in one area it might you know it does encourage people to start thinking well actually okay um, I can now justifiably you know I can fuel my concern about deforestation um, uh, because I can get data on it. and 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 maybe the same thing could happen over some of these other things that I care about yeah. so so um, I can see that in terms of you know, immediate news stories, a story about deforestation on the headlines is means there is one less likely, less likely of another story on a sort of similar, you know, agenda, but, but a similar broad, 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 but, but, but more, but, but it, I just wonder it catalyzes, it provides, you know, demonstration that actually, you know, increasingly it is hard to hide. 
Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Andrew. Nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Um, it, um, it there definitely is that catalyst catalytic effect as well. And you know, we see that there's a there's a research proposal in the works to link trace data to land matrix data, which is about land grabbing, um, basically. And that was you know the perception that that is possible. It's about changing the the bar and what's perceived to be possible, um, really. And I think if, if traces had any effect, it, it's been more on that. Um, it's demonstrated that um, you know more is possible than we perceived. Um, and, and of course, you know, there are certain big agendas, climate change and emissions accounting being, of course, the biggest. Um, and that can either exclude or it can provide a vehicle. Um, and of course, the extent to which it excludes or provides a vehicle um, is, is determined by, uh, you know, all of us and many others in, 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 in how we try and hitch things to bandwagons uh, and not let uh, one issue eclipse, but rather let it be a door opener. Uh, for wider agendas, um, and I, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think that increasingly, um, increasingly, we're seeing that. I think in 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 the extent to which climate change drags with it uh, other other agendas, actually. So I do see the positives, absolutely. Okay, uh, any more questions? I'll pitch in one while we're waiting for, for this. Uh, I was wondering about the potential for this also to work at the individual level of, uh, you know, there's an interesting increasing interest in sort of uh, being able to have food label, environmental labeling on foods and to be able to, able to determine, walking into supermarket, determine the, the actual footprint of, of, of the food stuff that they are consuming there. And is that something that you, one of the interfaces, entry points that you're thinking about? Uh, it was right at the beginning of this idea of producing an app that could scan your food. But of course, um, there's many layers of, 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 um, uh, of processing between what we're doing in mapping um, raw materials and an end product. That said, we are working quite a lot in the way in which the ways in which Trace can really upgrade um, LCA life cycle analyses, uh, which are the algorithms that are used to estimate footprints. Um, uh, in in these kinds of devices that aren't becoming increasingly popular actually and we're we're helping advise an initiative by uh, the, the cooperative supermarket in Sweden on this um, and basically how can you make uh, the impact factors regionalized um, so typically these calculators use um, you know they're very crude how much how much soy is in the product how much of that soy came from Brazil oh if it came from Brazil then it's got X um, it's, that's pretty that's pretty crude um, if it came from Brazil versus uh, versus Paraguay, then you know there can be quite a big difference. Um, never mind just within Brazil. Um, so uh, Trace can help regionalize those impact factors um, and make them supply chain specific, and in that way feed through. So we wouldn't produce those apps ourselves because that's a whole industry. But we are, as I mentioned, producing. I say we. Uh, this work has been led by Erasmus, <coughs> whom uh, some of you know, uh, Ungarsen. Um, and he uh, has produced a, an app with the team uh, that will, we hope, um, with the help of some of you, uh, go viral. Um, and Brazilians will be able to scan uh, meat packages in particular in Brazil uh, because they have a barcode on it that can tell you uh, which slaughterhouse it came from. Um, and our app will then link it to our data and it will tell you immediately how much deforestation is, uh, is associated with that package of meat. And if it's too high, it might go beep, beep. It down no um but it will it will uh, it will hopefully empower consumers uh, but it'll also give us an amazing database if it works okay that's it okay mark hi toby thanks um very much for that really interesting presentation um i've got a technical question which i didn't put on the spot but just um uh interested in kind of some of the underlying data here um so I was looking, I work on, do a lot of work in Ghana on cocoa, and I was looking at some of the data. Um, and I was interested that when you toggle between tonnage or volume and then financial flows, you get quite quite radically different kind of patterns. So for Ghana and cocoa, by volume, Brazil is the second largest importer, 18%, but much less significant in financial terms, around 4% of the value. And I just wondered kind of what's underlying that change in pattern. If you might not know, and that's a very specific question, but just kind of, yeah, what's, under, what's underlying some of those 
differences and then more more generally and perhaps a kind of fairer question is what do you see as the, the biggest blockages to kind of getting data that can be fed into these kind of tools yeah um i, I don't know the answer to the first question i'll be honest i like being put on the spot um <laughs> but that doesn't sound right to me that there's such a discrepancy between uh i mean it depends of course the obvious answer in some cases is that um you're looking at uh processing of the product um but if we're talking so it depends on what specific hs code uh, what specific commodity is being exported um but most of the cocoa as as you know comes out of uh, ghana ivory coast and goes to europe um so i'm going to look into that um i'm not quite sure what's going on there um but in terms of your bigger question um what are the main blockers the main blocker by far is access to trade data. Um, so trade data in some places is relatively commonplace. It's collected by trade intelligence companies and they live, trade intelligence companies live varyingly in the shadows or in the light. Um, let me put it that way. Um, and uh, in other places, uh, you can't get access to trade data for love or money. So Malaysia, we don't do any work in Malaysia because you just can't get access. And domestic trade data. So the main blocker of us being able to map the Indonesian palm, if you've looked on our Indonesia data, it stops in 2015 because we've got this beautiful algorithm and map and, and model, but it depends critically on uh, data on domestic shipments between islands in Indonesia. Otherwise you're likely to get completely the wrong outcome. And we had a great relationship with the, um, via one of our trusted partners with the um, uh, uh, anti-corruption agency in, in Indonesia, Kapika, but then the administration changed and any one of you knows who works in Indonesia, uh, Kapika got uh, kneecapped by the new administration and our relationship uh, kind of dried up. So we're quite at the mercy um, of some of these, uh, some of these relationships. But what we try and do is, is say, well, um, it would be possible to do X, but we don't, we can't because Y isn't available. Uh, therefore, we do uh, Z and, and Z is actually pretty crude, but part of the game we're playing is shifting the burden of proof um, instead of, uh, you know, the age old approach of an investigative journalist needing to identify that buyer A has a link to an impact. Otherwise, we assume that they're clean, that Trace helps invert that situation and says, well, you're all exposed. It's on you to demonstrate that you're not. Uh, it's on you to demonstrate that you're part of the solution, not part of the problem. And if you have to do that reliance, so Brazil is a good example. The Brazil beef lobby would love that we can't access the, the, the GTAs, the animal movement records. Um, and they consider that they're not in, in the public domain. Our lawyers consider that they are. So, you know, we go with our lawyers. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, if that data becomes unavailable, which in some cases it is, then we've got other ways for deducing where the meat might come from, but they're a hell of a lot cruder. They'll give a much larger supply shed for a given buyer and expose it to much more error. Yeah. Um, so our, our analyses become cruder uh, and blunter, but then we try and put the onus of changing that on others. That's like, that's, it's a bit of a get out, but it is the reality. Yeah, it's an interesting political strategy, I guess. Yeah, it gets you into all sorts of interesting conversations, I can assure you. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, yeah. Um, <laughs> brilliant. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, Erica? Hi, Ellie. Good to see um, So my question is relating a bit to the app because the deforestation risk, of course, is going to change through, through time, right? So you might buy a product now, which comes from a low deforestation risk place. But five years ago, deforestation risk was really high. So you could be benefiting areas that just in the short term, they were actually high deforestation risks. The area has been deforested illegally and have been consolidated. So how do you do, how you're gonna deal with this temporal variation in deforestation risk? Thanks, Erica, great question. Um, you've opened up a massive can of worms because um, this is very poorly treated by um, the sector, by the research community, by NGOs. 
uh, how we deal with lag periods as one thing, the lag between conversion, uh, planting, harvest, and export. There's a series of lags there. Um, and that's different too, because if you're trying to look at how much deforestation can be directly attributable to a, an exported harvest, then you want to ask first and foremost, how much new deforestation necessarily contributed to that harvest? So if you've got a, an area of 100 hectares and 20 hectares uh, were deforested in the last 10 years, say, and the rest was more historical, um, then you've got 20 hectares of new deforestation that are tainting that harvest of 100 hectares. Um, and separate to that is the question of authorization of responsibility historically, because of course, all land on which soy is grown in the Amazon, let's say, to be most concrete, was once forest, obviously. So uh, you don't have to go back that, that long uh, before it was, or you go back to 1998, probably to be precise, and all of it was forest uh, or pasture. Um, so we're not dealing with the second part, we're just dealing with the first, but we are developing ways in which you can, you can slide uh, and look at more years, basically. But if we just look specifically at beef, we are, or soy, we have, a, we have a lag period of five years that we use. So um, based on quite a lot of evidence, um, we considered it was also justifiable to have the same lag period uh, where we, um, we, we say if, in the case of soy, um, if there was deforestation um, uh, originally for, for, for cattle, but then it became soy, then we'll attribute that within five years, we'll attribute that deforestation to the soy in the fifth year. And in the case of cattle, you've got a longer time window because you've got the conversion for pasture and then you've got the five plus years of the life cycle of the cow. So it becomes 10 years actually. So the window in which we're looking back and similarly for pulp, because of the cycle, we've got a 10 year window. Uh, you end up looking at quite a large time period. Uh, so the risk is, the specific risk that you flag is mitigated. Um, but it's tricky because if you just allow um, users of data like Trace to decide, of course, then people will decide their own. And you know, the soy industry at one point tried to use one year, which is absurd, um, and then they settled on three years. Um, and um, you know, we use five years. You don't get that big a difference um, between uh, three and five in many places, but in some you do. But yeah, it's something that we think about a lot. Um, and are trying to improve our communication around. We're writing a paper precisely on this, actually a, a, a peer review paper, um, to try and help encourage more thinking on this because it's not very well uh, dealt with. And um, I mean, if you look at, if you look at, um, WRI had a report on the seven main commodities linked to deforestation globally quite recently. And they were very honest in saying, look, the deforestation goes down uh, in recent years linked deforestation, linked to soy, beef, et cetera, goes down mostly in recent years. Be very cautious in interpreting this, uh, misinterpreting this, because in part, it has to go down. If you've got a lag period, even of just two or three years, obviously, if you're in 2020 and you're only looking at 2019, 2021, 2022, conversion in 2019 to soy in 2021, 2022, hasn't obviously occurred yet. Therefore, there's an artifact in the data that deforestation will necessarily go down as you approach the present day, if you accept a lag. Um, we actually get around that by looking at the average uh, conversion time during a moving window of the last five years to see how many years does it take for deforestation, which is why we have numbers that say how much deforestation for soy <coughs> was there in the Sahado in 2018. <coughs> well, there was about, um, there was about 100,000 uh, hectares. Um, and, and that's because we know how many years it took in the previous five years, so we project forwards. We don't know if it will all become soy, but our best available. And of course, there's like 20 different ways in which you could project it. Um, rather than just using a simple moving attribute, you could have a fancy model. But um, it gives you a way of saying this is likely for soy. It's a great question. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, I'll put you in a final one. It's slightly uh, in response to your, your response to Mark's uh, question. Uh, so what, what, is, what do you think is the biggest challenge barrier to you being even more effective for Trace than what you are now? Uh, uh, I could potentially be overcome or would be taken, needed to overcome it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this is a question I ask people in interview. Um, I, I think the, uh, it's always good to get it back. 
Um, the biggest barrier is embedding, finding ways to embed trace data into other applications um, that will gain scale far more quickly than, than we will. Because we can do bits and pieces here and there in going directly from trace to some kind of impact. But um, if we can in, in, in inject trace data into LCA estimates, into ESG indices, um, into data products provided by the financial sector or to the financial sector, um, if we can um, establish it, as I think we're starting to, as a credible go-to source of data for um, analyses by uh, watchdog groups, um, basically how we can multiply, multiply up the, uh, I mean, notwithstanding their access challenges and such, um, how we can ensure that uh, the data is multiplied, um, the impact is multiplied, is our biggest barrier. And who are those actors that can help us do that multiplying? And and drumming and of course, then what what do you need to do to get there? There's lots of barriers within that, and one of them is about trying to be as crystal clear as we can with our limited resources about our data and our methods. So we're not having to, because um, one of the one of the killers of our productivity is lots of superficial interest. Everyone ringing up for a, oh, can I have a call? Sounds interesting. It might be useful for us, and I typically say no or wish I could say no. Um, because you know the call is they're not going to have a well thought through request or they're going to if it's a company they're probably got two people in their sustainability department far better that we engage with their industry association or that we engage with consultancies that, are, that they're paying or that we engage with and we engage with pressure groups that are trying to shape them than try and do too much direct engagement but of course it's you also want to hear what they've got to say because it shapes the use case you can't say no to everybody, but it's a tricky balance. Um, but certainly a productivity killer um, is, is, is a, not a sometimes overwhelming amount of superficial interest because it's a shiny object. Um, and there's only so many Zoom calls you can be on. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, that's a good point to end the Zoom call, I think. <laughs> uh, any, <laughs> uh, uh, so if no more questions, uh, thank you once again, to Toby, in a, for a terrific overview of, of Trace. Uh, and also just a, a congratulations, I think it's a fantastic uh, product and uh, really, really, really useful and transformative. And uh, in the seminar tradition, uh, I'd like everyone who wants to ask one mute your microphone and let's give a, an audible uh, round of applause to, to our oh, speaker. Oh, wow, that's a novelty. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. It's great to see you all. Thank you, Edvinda. Thanks, Erica, for organizing and inviting me. Much appreciated. Please do send comments, questions, ideas, critiques, uh, including on discrepancies in uh, cocoa value and volume uh, to us. Uh, much appreciated. Great. And uh, as I said, well, I'll put this onto YouTube and uh, so feel free to share it with colleagues and students, etc. As, uh, as wide as you wish. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks. Much appreciate it. Have a good weekend. Thank Thanks. Thanks, Evan. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Ciao, Tavi. Ciao, ciao.